So today is part of the Magic's webinar series during this partial lockdown that we're having this restricted mm -hmm. open audience. So we hope that everyone staying at home can be a little bit more productivity, uh, productive and pick up a couple of skills here and there. So my name is Bikesh. I, I run a venture firm called Lead Ventures, spelled 1337 Ventures itself. And I'm going to share with you some kind of trends that we start seeing in 2020, but also how these trends have uh, changed or new opportunities have arise from this current period of uncertainty we're having itself. So I'm going to just walk you through that. The whole idea is to, to talk about the whole doom and gloom of the situation, but what can a business do right now? If you're not jumping into new verticals and new trends that I speak about, are there new business models that you should revisit or pivot in terms of how you're doing things? So let's just go through the slides. So I'm sure you've seen all these companies before. They have really big names. Some people call them unicorns. But some of these companies, in fact, all of these companies, they were born out of a critical time itself, some particular crisis. These were the ones that came up through the, the last global financial crisis that was in 2008. Notable names that you would have seen is, of course, Airbnb and Uber. And then the logos at the bottom are from past crisis itself. So I'm just going to walk you through this timeline. So there's always good times and there's always bad times. The whole idea is with resilience in a founder and with good leadership, these could be opportunities for you to build something great again. Uh, so IBM and GE came in during the panic of the 1890s that was during some sovereign wealth fund crisis that, was, that occurred back then. Uh, back in the 1930s, the Great De Depression itself saw things like Revlon come up. In the 50s, you had Hyatt Hotels and Trader Joe's during the Cold War. In the 70s, you see notable names like FedEx and Microsoft show up during the oil crisis. And in the 90s, where you have the whole dot-com bubble, uh, notable names would be things like Amazon and Salesforce. And of course, the last financial crisis saw so Uber and Airbnb. So what about now? What about 2020, where you, you're having this whole coronavirus issue itself? Have we found someone that is um, short-term or maybe not just short-term, but figure out something that could last post-crisis to basically be the next big thing. Of course, Zoom would be the obvious thing we talk about video conferencing, but how, how long would they exist after this? Because there's so many options in the market and Zoom may be, be having that little short ride at the moment itself. So I want to talk about this particular company itself. It's called GrowWork. Startup less than a year old, offering remote working solutions. Not many people have heard of this, but you've seen a 10x increase in your customers around this particular pandemic time itself. So what's their premise is, uh, they understand that most remote workers prefer to work from home as opposed to working in co-work spaces or coffee shops. So it's a great solution and basically fits the current time. But the more importantly, will this basically test it post-crisis? That's the kind of business models we want to talk about. So will they be like the same guys that we talk about opportunities out there? You see them on Lazada and Shopee buying face masks, hand sanitizers in bulk. Are they going to be stuck with a lot of stock at the end? Uh, are they just marking up in very short-lived kind of business models? So we saw that grow work basically were conceived before the coronavirus pandemic itself. So we're tapping more into the long-term opportunity about remote working space. The whole premise was if people preferred working from home rather than co-work spaces, and in certain overcrowded cities like Hong Kong and Singapore, even KL, the rates of these co-worker spaces are not necessarily cheap. They are quite pricey. So their business model was saying, you stay and work at home, and they would deliver the necessary equipment for you to set up your home offices itself. So that was a quite interesting model, and we think that this can basically test the test of time. So that's the kind of things that we want to make sure that you do right now. Don't try to jump into something short term because people are on lockdown. But imagine what happens after, what are new behaviors that are being formed right now that you could basically adapt to for your particular businesses itself. So if you look at Uber and Airbnb, they both came around the same time in 2008 during the global financial crisis. Their value propositions and business models were valid at that time, but also after, because everyone was always trying to figure out how to have uh, more use for excess inventory assets that they have, and also trying to have a side passive income is something that everybody wants. So Airbnb made travel relatively uh, more affordable at a time where travel was expensive during the global financial crisis with the exchange rate, especially. But they tested the test of time. In fact, now itself, you could see maybe Airbnb 
trying to not pivot, but make sure they are relevant. People are not traveling, so Airbnb rentals were down, but they tried to figure out how they could adapt. And that's where things like uh, having Airbnb spaces for frontliners to be utilized in certain areas where they needed to have access people working in hospitals and all was definitely a fit for them to basically still exist. But simple tweaks could even be how Airbnb could do things for offices. Airbnb how you have trying to not give it, but make sure. So how you could use it for offices. One thing we noticed sure, yeah. that the space that we were in was uh, companies were always looking for secondary sites. So that was a great model for co-work spaces to offer that particular service as itself. The other one that we saw was, of course, Uber that came in at the same time. It left a lot of people without jobs. So therefore, I'll try and speak a bit more slowly if it was cutting off just now. Left people without jobs. So Uber was a way that people could get some new income. And that's still valid today. If you look at the variations of Uber, which is Grab over here, it's become more than that. It's become uh, pretty much the super app that does everything and not just deliveries in terms of sending people uh, to and fro, but also in terms of a dispatch service, a food delivery service, and everything else you can think between. So these two companies then became a business model. People talk about the Uber of X, the Uber of Y, or the Airbnb of pet hotels, the Airbnb of that. It became a business model itself, synonymous to basically that. So that was quite interesting. So what is the opportunity that we're seeing right now, especially here in Malaysia with the whole current lockdown situation or the partial lockdown, whatever you want to call that? One is we've noticed that there is a great access to talent. Uh, a lot of young people graduated from great universities may not be going for that highly paid jobs because they're not there itself. Uh, experienced workers are choosing to take this opportunity to maybe uh, part by themselves if they see there's a slowdown in their particular work or certain uncertainty. But of course, we, we started racing people doing some layoffs in certain verticals because we just can't have enough cash flow to operate that particular uh, runway of maybe the next six, 12 months itself. So there is access to talent in the market, that's for sure, because we see them applying for some of our programs already. The fact that this lockdown may even be extended, or it's really extended for the next two weeks. So people have time on their hands and they are running out of things to do. If they have a good work from home policy and they're doing that fine, but we notice that people are still itching for more. So this has been a great time to experiment new things and you should think about using that time too. And that is sort of like a captive audience at the moment right now, right? You notice that you've gained so much time back from uh, not having commutes, not having lunches outside there. And you are just constantly looking for new solutions and new things you could do with your particular time. So these three things coming together is very powerful for you to, to figure out what could you leverage these things on. So add that to the current statistics I want to talk about how connected Malaysians are. If you look at our current stats, just, just to make sure everyone's on the same baseline information here, total population is about 30 million. There's more mobile subscription than people in this particular country. So everyone has got like 1.2 phone lines in their pocket somehow. Internet connectivity is pretty decent. It's 80%. Everyone's accessible practically out of social media and very mobile. So people are very connected. They, they all have access, right? So that's basically good. If you look at how well connected they are, everyone has used social media in the last month. Definitely in the last day or last hour, I'm sure you're on social media right now. Uh, you spend a close to three hours a day on social media. The average person has more than one social media account across all the different tools that's out there. And, and that's pretty staggering numbers itself. If you talk about how long emulation spends online on the internet. So this was before the whole partial lockdown situation. It's like eight hours long. What more now when you're at home all the time, Netflixing and chilling all the time, that number is definitely staggering more higher itself. Uh, and of course, in terms of daily TV viewing, in terms of broadcast and streaming, I think this number has gone up too. So you have a great captive audience at the particular time of being. Um, so in general, you know, we eat, breathe and sleep technology. Pre-MCO and post-MCO, it's gonna be more than that. So this is what it looks like we talk about customer journey in terms of the average day of a Southeast Asian uh, mobile internet user, be it Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, within this region itself, you find that technology is everywhere that you basically have a day-to-day -day interaction with. From waking up, I mean, how many of you actually have a alarm clock that's traditional if it's not your smartphone? 
Uh, so of course, if you try and let's say skip ahead and look at how this journey looks like with MCO, your commute to work is basically gone. You're going from breakfast table to your laptop, maybe 30 seconds rather than a one hour drive in KL traffic itself. Your lunch is definitely now maybe a little bit more shorter and your commute back is only gonna be a couple of seconds long, right? So you're saving even more time in your particular day-to-day -day journey. So what are people doing? What are people demanding to have access to at this point of time? So let's try and leverage things like that. We know Malaysians are still receptive to new products. Uh, if you look at some of the stats, it's a bit old, but this, we don't have the latest stats of this. But in 2018 itself, there's over 1 billion apps downloaded. And in terms of money being spent on apps, people do spend money on apps. I mean, you'll tune into a Zoom session now, which is a paid webinar module. So everyone's spending on tools that they basically need in this particular time of need itself. So we did a talk like this back in January, of course, updated the talk. So I want to show you what happened back in Jan and what happened now, how the apps look like in terms of download. Back in 27 Jan itself, uh, primarily one of the top apps that was free downloaded in iOS, it was the wallets. That was also because of the, uh, the E29 that came out of the budgets for this year. But if you look at the current apps that's currently being downloaded now, it's kind of different, right? You see collaborative and communication tools become some of the top things that people are downloading from Zoom to House Party to Google Classroom. Google Classroom, of course, contributed to all the kids who have to do their homework during this lockdown itself. But you can see a big shift. Uh, people are looking into chat apps, movie apps, uh, shopping apps to basically get all these things done. In terms of Android, it's going to be the same thing. Initially, it was... Uh, Boost and Touch and Go were the two top wallets itself. And now it's basically uh, gone up to communication tools again. Uh, one thing interesting was if you look at paid apps, not much has changed. Paid apps has always been about entertainment, and that's primarily games. Games before, games after, even on Android, which people say they don't pay for stuff, <laughs> they're also paying for games. But if you look deeper into the numbers, if you have access to it, you'll notice that more and more people are paying. And people who weren't players are actually playing games right now to keep themselves uh, busy on that particular lockdown period. So funny thing is, you know, WHO basically once announced that gaming is a disorder for people who play this a lot. It was linked to a mental disease or something. But now they're saying differently, right? They're encouraging you to play video games so you can stay at home and, and stay sane. So just as a funny thing that we notice itself. If you look at trends on Google searches, so this is available through trends.google.com. We try to compare some things that are happening on a global level and a local level itself. There's some things that are similar, some things that are not. One is, of course, vegetable delivery. So on a global level for the past 90 days, you can see it, it's spiked up pretty good. Uh, in terms of Malaysia itself, uh, it spiked a little bit at the beginning itself, but towards the end, you could see some major spikes. So it's quite consistent. I think everyone's having the issue of getting vegetables to their doorstep. Uh, they don't want to go out to a grocery mart, or when you go there, there's not many left. So they're looking for alternative options. But if you look at e-learning, what was interesting is it, it also spiked on a global level. Uh, a lot of it, if you look into detail, were mostly students in universities giving out access to all their MOOC content, and people are excited to learn new things. But from a local level, you don't really see a big trend in terms of that. In fact, what the trend shows is it's quite consistent. So one thing interesting is, you know, apart from running Elite uh, Ventures, 15 years ago, we set up a training company called iTrain, and that runs till now, and we do a lot of corporate trainings. And we started seeing in the last couple of years already companies bracing for this and, and trying to figure out how can they get employees to learn more. It wasn't for this particular moment in time, but what they wanted to make sure was, how did they get the most out of an employee? Sending an employee for five days training was quite ridiculous in this point of time. So they wanted to get most of the employees to learn on their own before that, learn basics. When it comes to people like us, where they want to pick up new skills, they only learn that advanced materials. So basic materials, introduction stuff was something that most corporates were trying to figure out how to learn on the go via mobile or online already. So that's quite interesting to see Malaysia on the bar for that particular trend where they were ahead of that schedule. So these are some of the hot sectors we've noticed since the last couple of years, and we think this is going to be going for the, uh, the next few hot things to talk about. I'll go deeper in this, but I want to talk about some other things that we've noticed have been recently too. So of course, it's around fintech, health tech, agri, edutech, and social enterprise. The last talk I did, 
I didn't focus so much in edu tech, but we noticed that in the last couple of months, this has become a little bit more bigger. Well, I explain why, what are the big issues they're facing in that sector as well. So one thing you could talk about now is, you know, if you're on this call and you're saying, but I'm not in those sectors, nor do I want to jump into a new sector, then what can I do? How can you help me right now? So we noticed that a couple of business models that made more sense in this point of time, and this business model has been picking up quite well if you are the owner of such supplies. So we call this the D2C model where you're directly going from the supplier, the brand to the consumer. Uh, in the US, it's predominated by a couple of unicorns where they supply mattresses, a company called Casper. You've got shoes and of course, razor blades with people like Harry's and also Dollar Shave Club. Over 4 billion invested in this particular scene. And if you look into statistics out there, uh, people expect out of uh, 10 purchases by 2025, Four out of it is going to be directly you buying from a particular uh, vendor directly. That means you go to Nike.com and buy your shoes rather than go to JD Spot or you similar, you go to Bata.com to buy shoes rather than go to Lazada to buy it itself. So the price value trade-offs in this is pretty much uh, impressive itself. So here's an example, right? Like if I told you, how would you sell $100 million worth of mattresses directly to customers? What would you do? The first thing my and most people would think is I've got to have as much inventory as possible, as many options as possible, so I could sell many variations. But what we've seen is actually the reverse. It's about limiting choice, just having a couple of different uh, particular product variations. So in terms of Casper, they started with just one, two different kind of mattresses. And what they did was just make sure to have an affordable price point, and that was meaning to get rid of all the middlemen. So the current issues we're seeing right now was the whole supply chain. So the direct to consumer guys are not having that much issues with the supply chain because they've been trying to get rid of the, all the people in between that makes it impossible to run such a business, right? And the whole idea then is to deliver straight to your house. So what you had to figure out then was logistics, you partner someone who could do that or figure out how to offer this on your own if, depending on your particular scale. So in the first 28 days of Casper running this business, they sold 1 million worth of products. I mean, you'd be thinking like, how the hell would you buy mattresses online? So they came up with quite interesting ways to do it. It's very internet marketing style. One was they're saying, well, you have a money back guarantee after 100 days. So you could take this mattress home, ship it to you. They'll figure out how to send it even if it's a high rise building and carry it up the stairs if they have to. You could try it for 100 days. And if it's still not something you want, return it back and you get your money back. Uh, no questions asked itself. So in less than two years, they did 100 million uh, sales itself. So that's quite amazing. And we start seeing that happen locally, right? So these are two of our particular investments that we see doing this right now. Homegrown Farms is a guy from a TV production company who has pivoted to run a production as in food production company itself. He built a farm at the back of his house. We invested him uh, in him about a couple of years ago along with Kazana. So he has one interesting price offering itself, 50 ringgit for vegetable deliveries in a week. What vegetables you get, that's up to him what he plants. All you know is for 50 ringgit a week, you're gonna get fresh, uh, local grown organic food sent to you itself. Simple as that, right? You know you need veggies and you just adapt to what veggies are sent to you, but you don't pick that you want kailan, you want this, you want that. You just basically get 50 ringgit worth of vegetables. So the the, the unique value proposition here is it's sort of like a third cheaper than getting organic vegetables from the store. So they limited their choice direct to you affordable prices itself. So home, home taste was the same. They do uh, deliveries of food for lunches and dinners, especially dinners. What we found was people just want to get a subscription based dinner to their homes for a family to eat. People always run out of ideas what to cook. So the idea is if you gave them a menu and saying, what would you like to eat? the same question will always arise, right? What do you want to eat? No one knows that question. So we just have them basically pay for subscription and we send food to them and just eat whatever we send them. And we see that that's going real well. So this is now evolving to what they call cloud kitchens. And I'll talk a little bit more how that cloud kitchens work from this particular uh, D2C model itself. Uh, talking about the homegrown ideas will be Ox White. I think you've seen this basically do a quite a successful uh, crowdfunding campaign recently itself. They cut away the middleman so that they could get really transparent pricing and quality clothing to you at very affordable prices. So coming back to the current situation with the virus out there and the whole partial lockdown that's happening, 
what happened is you see a lot of people saying that they can't have access to food trucks and fresh markets. And some people in Cameron Highlands were saying, we're, we're getting rid of all the vegetables because you know our supply chain has basically gone and, and we can't basically figure out how to deliver that. So this is where a D2C model would have been great. Of course, Lazada came to the rescue, but what if they had technologies to figure out how to leverage a direct to consumer software as a service model itself? So who is building solutions that makes me to see a little bit more easier and a little bit more manageable. So I'll speak about that in a bit. So if you want to switch to a direct to consumer model itself, there are a few things to do, right? The first thing you want to do is survey the current market landscape, figure out uh, what are customers pricing out there? Is it a good price? Is it a bad price? So we saw that for organic vegetables, not the best prices that were out there. Um, how do legacy brands communicate directly with customers? And that's something that you see D2C customers or D2C companies do real well, the communication directly with their particular uh, customers itself. To have that expectations always get adapted and make sure you listen to the problems on the ground and adapt directly itself. Uh, focus on simplicity is number two. That means don't have too many different variations of a product. So if right now you're stuck in this situation of having access to inventory, that's because you had too many SKUs. So if you just had a couple of things, trying to move that particular product may be a little bit more simpler. Then it's all about leveraging technology. So how do you find a CRM that works from you and get serious about customer service? So this is where we also see the opportunity. One is you being someone getting into the direct-to-consumer approach. But the other thing we saw is if you were a technology person listening to the stock and saying, look, I've got nothing to sell. How is this relevant to me? Build services for the direct to consumer route itself. So that's what's missing that we found itself, uh, right? Rather than just them uh, rely on an existing marketplace and jump on that, where are the specific tools that help them do this? Where is that little homegrown CRM software for a smallholder farmer? Where is that accounting system for a smallholder farmer itself? Where is that logistics provider that basically just says, I, I'll handle your fresh vegetable delivery and you could subscribe to that. So when we started doing the whole cloud kitchen concept, we saw there was a lot of people online that wanted to sell food, especially in this point of time. And they came to us with very interesting questions. They were saying, look, I've got a kitchen, I can cook real well, but I don't know how to market myself. I want to sell directly to customers, but I don't know how to do that. Can I pay you for that? So a startup that was just providing food directly to customers now has come up with a whole new revenue model because of that. They're offering them uh, sort of like a software as a service and consultancy as a service to teach them how to do that. So if they don't know how to do customer service, we're doing it on their behalf. So they pay our startups uh, a retainer monthly to do their social media engagement itself. When it comes to in terms of putting their software out there or their products out there, they don't know how, we let them leverage our particular tool. Either you can OEM it or we become sort of like a pseudo marketplace. And then we can also do the pickup and the deliveries for them. So all they do is focus on the cooking. And then in terms of directly going to consumer, people still engage with their brand but it's run by a third party service provider. So that whole SaaS model, the software as a service model for the direct to consumer market is something very interesting that we've seen pick up, kind of tools that's needed for that, analytics, understanding of course, which is point number five, embracing data. Most of these companies might be SMEs, very traditional business owners. I don't think so, they know how to leverage this data, even understand behaviors out there. So this is where you come in and try and build tools that uh, figures out how you, in layman terms, make data a little bit more into information that they could basically understand and people are willing to pay for such information. One example, I guess, would be Sinking, which basically had issues in terms of managing your branches and they built their own solution called Black Box, where they understand leakages within retail industry. And now they made that whole software that they built for internal as a service they offer other SMEs who have branch distributions to figure out insights to how their sales are operating from uh, a branch management perspective. So a whole new revenue stream for them, which was quite interesting from a product they built for themselves. So coming back to this particular diagram, if you've not seen this before, this is called a business model canvas. I want to emphasize this. This is not just a one-on-one -on -one thing that basic startups basically do. This is something that everyone needs to do. And where you need to focus on the two bottom columns here, the cost and the revenue. This is something we make sure all our startups always do. If it wasn't for this situation, I don't think so. People will always you know, pause and reflect and think about con continuity plans and contingency plans. So if you did this canvas properly, then you would have thought about the threats you would have. Like what are 
uh, margins threatened by competitors coming into stuff like that? How excessive are you dependent on a certain revenue stream or how excessive are you dependent on a certain customer segment? So that's like the, what we call a customer concentration risk. What if that particular customer now is gone or lost? Does that mean you fall just because you're dependent on one particular sector? So a lot of things for you to think about when you basically build such a business model itself. And then the opportunities is trying to figure out how do you change this whole one-time transaction revenues to something recurring? So in terms of our homegrown farms, rather than just selling vegetables online, we made it subscription basis where people have been paying us 50 ringgit a week and, and for consecutively many, many months, just buying vegetables every week, every month. Even our particular home taste company, we had people who joined them like over one, two years ago, subscribing dinners, and they have not stopped subscribing dinners till today. So the idea is you have to try these different opportunities of revenue models. If you don't try it, you will never know if it basically works. Because the last thing, you know, is like increasing prices and reducing costs. That's the last thing you can do and maybe not the best thing you can do at this point of time because then you see be seen as very opportunistic itself. So if you prepared for the worst with all the other elements that we spoke about here, then that's going to give you a, a good fighting chance to survive this next few months. So what is the business model? Uh, the three things that make up a good business model, right? You create value, which is your product. So that's your thing. I can't help you so much with that. What you want to make sure is if you have a great product, figure out how you deliver value, marketing, and capture value, which is profits. How do you have a business model that makes you money itself? Then it's about just having that balance to hit that sweet spot. If you were short on one thing, like you know, capturing value itself, then you're not making much profits. As an investor, I would say this is not fundable at all. If you're focusing not so much on the delivering the value, where it's something very hard to sell, your lifetime value of a customer and the ratio of it to customer acquisition cost is not a great uh, ratio itself, then people are just going to wait and see whether that picks up before they invest into it. Of course, I won't talk about create value because that's the product. You have a crappy product, no, nothing you do is going to solve it. So the create value, the product has to always be great. It's just about playing around with how you capture value and deliver value. What are new chances of you to collaborate and deliver such products to people? So now with the whole uh, RMO, MCO, you find that if you had an offline business, that's going to be quite difficult. So you have to figure out what are channels you could use that are online or leveraging other partners itself. So if you go online, there's a lot of business models you can read off. I'm not going to spend time on all these things, but you will have access to the slides at the end. Please do read what are the different business models out there so that you can focus on that. I'm going to go a bit more faster. So some trends that we see you know, shaping up in 2020 was the rise of super apps. Everyone's heard of Grab and heard of all the other ones. But we start seeing new players come in. And one interesting thing we've been looking at was how DG is coming up with this old HR solution called All HR. And they're speaking to people like us, hopefully we could uh, find partners in terms of startups to build on top of this platform. So a HR platform is something like the basis of foundation of a company, an SME or an enterprise, where every employee is plugged into that. So imagine if you could start build products and services on top of such super apps itself. You now have access to all the employees and they're Concerns would be in terms of health and travel and this and that. There's so many ways you could find angles to, to communicate with them. E-payments, of course, that's always going to be there. We find that more and more people are going to look at ways to spend money digitally rather than handle cash. The do it for me, which is that very service-oriented industry, is pretty much picking up. So if I don't want to go to a grocery store, I want to get someone to do it for me, the Uberification of people. There are great startups out there like GoGet, but I don't know if that's enough. There's, there needs to be more. On-demand food and transport, definitely, it's still not solved. Uh, I'll give an example where this is then hand-in-hand -in -hand with cloud kitchens. I live in Cyberjaya. Yes, I actually do. If I wanted the best nasi lemak, I mean, it's arguable, you know, which is the best nasi lemak. Just say I want the village park nasi lemak itself. I can't even get that here. Unless I go to someone like do it for me style, go get saying, I'll pay you to go up and down the max highway, buy me an asylum and come to me and pay 50 bucks for that. That's possible. But for me to have food panda, grab food, go to Nasilama in the village park and buy it and send it all the way here, that's not even an option to give me in my geolocation, right? So that's where someone like Village Park now can come closer to me and saying, if I want to serve Cyber Jaya, Putrajaya and Bangi area and around that side, let me build Village Park close to me. But of course, I don't need a full-blown restaurant. I just need a kitchen. So that's where cloud kitchens basically come in. You're going to start seeing people create this location, sprouting different places itself. 
uh, where it's not to serve customers in terms of uh, walk-ins, but just to cook and have someone come and pick up on their own or deliver to that stuff. So how do you get closer to my particular zip code itself? Local procurement, I think this is something that most SMEs are crying about in the last couple of days. It's like, I can't survive, I need cash flow, people don't know I exist. How could now, post-COVID, once the MCO is lifted, how do we support more local SMEs? I like what Storehub was trying to do to basically say everyone using a POS system, let's put them online and make it a discovery platform for like a marketplace. But this will be something similar, but from someone who just provides any kind of raw materials or a vendor that provides supplies to a particular company itself. How do someone as big as DG or big as Max is know that they can procure things from local distributors, local companies, local SMEs, and rather than go to a big boy itself? So that's something to basically see. Now, of course, the most interesting thing, I mean, I can face this in some of our other companies itself, is debt collection. There's definitely opportunities in this post this particular lockdown for someone to go knock on doors or find a way to digitally figure out how to collect money, sort of like a 555 online kind of stuff, right? So I'll quickly now go into the, the verticals I mentioned, because I've done a talk on this before. I know some of you have attended that talk, so I don't want to stress too much about that. So in terms of the world of fintech, we know that you know that's still a big thing locally. Everyone is, 85% of us have access to a bank account. We're not an unbanked country itself. But you notice that we're very debit card oriented rather than credit card. 85% is debit card, 21% over is credit card itself. Uh, we work with Bank Nagar to come up with you know, what are problems in the industry. There's a lot of particular problem statements still in the financial side of things. So if you're looking for ideas to solve, uh, it's all there. You can't read this, I'm sure, but it's available, searchable on ideas.lead.account. So go to that URL and you can traverse all those particular problem statements. I want to highlight that there's a couple of that that make sense right now. One of it, of course, is through the individual where we talk about PFMs, personal finance management apps right now makes more sense of me keeping track of my expenses, making sure that if I've got a 30% pay cut or retrench, I want to make sure I stretch my dollars. So I need someone to give me visibility of everything that I'm basically paying into one consolidated area. We don't have such a solution right now. And the other interesting things on the finance side will be for SMEs, right? The alternative credit scores. People are saying now, great, there's this RF, uh, SRF fund for SMEs to borrow. But if I wanted to borrow and you, you baseline me and do credit scoring me based on a typical SME, which is two, three years of audit, and I'm fresh out of the boat, less than one year operation, less than two years operation, what's going to happen to me? Can't you figure out a new credit score for someone like me that still shows I've got a viable business and I should be lend some money itself? So same thing goes like for farmers, right? What's the credit score of a farmer? How would you lend farmers money so that they could plant more produce and solve more issues in terms of food security levels? So in the SME space, in terms of creating a micro uh, banking system, a micro POS system for the guy on the street to do his particular businesses, there's still an avenue for that that we see is not solved. So that's something to think about. In terms of healthcare, uh, still some basic things out there, right? Obesity, undernutrition, still not solved. Uh, of course, that's a big problem to solve and just stating it out there itself. But one interesting thing to think about is in the next couple of, like next 10, 20 years, the aging population. So if you look at this graph down here, let me just put on this annotated spotlight. So in this particular area here itself, you notice by 2040, there's a lot of older people in this particular country, right? You're talking about 50 and 60 above. So if this guy start now taking out the EPF money, then there's a lot of issues there they're going to get as a fund. But that also means there's a lot of old people that will have access to money soon. And there's a lot of services that they basically need, but not necessarily they're being served as a market. So that's something to think about. What are solutions out there that you want to serve that aging nation itself, which Malaysians would be in a few years time itself. So that's an opportunity in that space. Uh, in terms of healthcare, also we noticed that there were certain goals in terms of trying to put a, a EMR, where they're talking about electronic medical records in the market through hospitals. So this slide came from Ministry of Health from Dr. Fazila. Thank you very much if you're listening. Uh, so I just want to tell you not so much on the actual goals, what they want to do, because that's kind of big problems. But the situation right now in terms of saying that, you know, more than 75% of hospitals don't even have any electronic systems, right? They're very paper-based. Uh, most of the health clinics are still manual. So in terms of what we see happening, people are still trying to solve queuing systems, prescription systems. If I don't want to go to a clinic and I want to get medical stuff sent to me, uh, the rise of things like doctor on call, uh, doc to you, book doc, 
a lot of these great applications are doing quite well in this particular time. But the ideal goal they want to look at, if you look at the desired outcome section here, is how can everything be integrated into a, a Malaysian healthcare system where it connects everyone together itself? So this is very far away from happening. We're talking about five years from now. But the ideal situation is uh, to have that particular goal solved through uh, things of coordination, through wide scale technology, operational and financial efficiency within clinics, uh, how you improve quality of health and outcomes through technology itself, giving doctors and the medical profession itself, where the people at the back, data-driven insights in terms of situations like this, and just improving the patient customer experience. What they want ideally is you know, public versus private healthcare. How do you make sure that they are equal at par, right? In terms of agri-tech, I'm sure you read all this particular news about the issues they were having in terms of delivering food from some of these big farms. Uh, but there's so many other different issues. One major thing is to basically see here is our food security levels, right? So in terms of the food security index, Malaysia is number four, T, Singapore is at number one. How do you make sure that we have enough food to depend on that produced locally and not imported in? How do you make sure food's a little bit more affordable and available and the quality and safety is basically there? There was a scare recently, it's uh, one of the headlines that we looked at, actually talked about there was only two and a half months of rice left in this country. I think that was blown out of proportion, just someone just trying to get clicks on, on your particular news feed itself. But uh, it's not, not far-fetched to say that, you know, we've not hit our targets for 2020 itself. I had a slide on that, which I'm not showing, but we've not hit our targets in terms of having that food security levels out there. So it all rides to these particular challenges out there, right? One is farmers have poor access to financing because you know credit worthiness, they don't even have a proper accounting system to show that they understand their finances. So how would you allow them to do this? So we recently invested into a new startup that was trying to look at how do you build a uh, accounting system for the farmers so that they could basically have better credit worthiness or visibility to how they manage their financial services. So you could give them particularly P2P loans. There's this thing about human capital development, having access to workforce, especially now, day labors uh, with the whole MCO going on, how does this basically work? There's not enough innovation in terms of R&D from the input, so growing better uh, seeds, growing better, more efficient plants itself. So there's a few things that's happening out there, right? Another one that basically is there is about access in terms of land. So if I wanted to be a farmer, how easy is it for me to even get land to start farming itself? So if you look at it from a modernization perspective into the whole supply chain or the vertical value chain of agriculture, the things to be solved in each particular point of time, like even talk about food production, vertical farming, aquaponics, something interesting. So one of our investments in terms of homegrown farms, we were just trying to try this out. We managed to grow rice, paddy, uh, in, in less than three months from an aquaponics setup. An uh, 80 square feet area gave us about six kilograms of basically rice. So imagine if you could do that and you could have rice growing at the back of your house. In terms of processing it, you could figure that out through a certain service itself. But that'll be interesting to see how people think of new ways to bring access to food to the table uh, on an individual basis itself. Now, of course, the more easier ones will be towards the end where you talk about the market and distribution, which is the whole trading platform. And that's what the Cameron Highland people were talking about, right? If my supply chain people were not there, how would I sell directly to a consumer, the D2C model? Where's the platform that allowed me to do this uh, rather than Lazada? Could there be a, a tech provider that gave them the access to sell directly to the consumer and then figure out the logistics for them itself? So things to be done in that side. Um, in terms of ad tech, uh, the opportunities we see, of course, with the whole current situation is, you know, more and more people are forced to learn online, especially kids. Well, most schools, including Malaysia, are trying to adopt things like either YTL's Frog or Google Classroom to learn online. What's funny is how the kids have decided they could beat the system by giving bad reviews to the apps and make sure the apps leave the store so the kids don't have to do homework. That's just something funny to pivot to. But this study I want to stress on, right? So it was a 2016 study by McKenzie where they talked about could machines replace humans? And if you look at this particular chart and you traverse down this particular chart itself, you found that education was the least vulnerable to technology disruption. It's very hard to basically disrupt that. Uh, of course, you see this whole plethora of things like MOOCs online, teaching online, but this is just one part, right? The content. I think education is bigger than just the content. It's what do you do outside the classroom that severely lacks uh, innovation. 
So running a training center for the last 15 years on our other division, we noticed that some interesting things that people have been asking us to solve. One was that whole, how do you do something technical online in terms of for students, how would you do lab sessions online? How do you virtualize or simulate that? How do you teach music online? Uh, technical skills like programming, how do you code online with different platforms and virtualize and simulate certain things. Certain things, yeah, it makes sense you could do, but licensing from Apple where you simulate iOS online is technically downright illegal and they try and shut you down for things like that. So there are things that you have to work around. Uh, with this situation where a lot of people are going to get retrenched or uh, maybe get pay cuts, there's an opportunity to reskill people for sure. So you could say, but you know, you could just go on Udemy and learn all this content online. Why should we build something differently locally? Uh, we found that looking at the last one here, there's a provision definitely for localized content. We go to places like Thailand, they don't consume things on Udemy and they want something in local Thai, uh, Malaysia, maybe we can consume international content, but they want us to provision things that's localized to them. So if I'm doing design thinking courses for some of the local banks, they want to see how design thinking is applied in the banking sector, which you don't have such niche content on, on Udemy itself. And right now we're seeing people ask us, how do I do design thinking for learning development uh, or HR companies. So there's very just niche topics you could do and, and produce it at home and put it on there. I would love to talk to you if you want to build content like that for us. But one interesting thing we see that's severely lacking is the whole coordination of training online. So one bank that we worked on with was to train about 46,000 employees across four countries online. But you can't just say here, HR, send this email to 46,000 employees, click this link and just go and learn on Udemy itself. There's still a lot of coordination efforts and planning and management that there's no tool out there that does that. Same thing goes for this Zoom session, right? We have to use Eventbrite to register you in and then bring you into a Zoom session. So there's still a lot of friction to have an all-in-one solution that does everything and coordinate you. What if there was 300 of you that want to do some face-to-face -face sessions with us? How do I break you into different rooms and all? So still some complexities there that's not being solved and it's worth basically solving. And the final one I want to talk about, just in terms of the social aspect that we should always look at, is the, the rise of social enterprise. In fact, I wouldn't say it has to be about social enterprises, but how do we make sure whatever that we build from now on, can you guys just look at what you could do to make an impact, right? So like some of our food startups we work with, we, we talk about how do you educate the people that we use more sustainable material in it? How do you stop using things like plastic and use uh, compostable items itself? It may increase your cost, but how do you ed educate the consumer why you're doing this? So you just make a little change. So in terms of the social issues, there's a lot of things to be solved. Here's a list of it that came from uh, the AIM folks that was working on the social agenda locally. And I think Magic has some great SE programs and SE boot camps coming up too on this. Uh, look at this when you have time to look at the slides and see if there's something here that's worth solving and you can basically solve itself, right? So to summarize, there's still a lot of opportunities that we have in this time of crisis that we notice. Uh, one thing you have to make sure if you're not in that particular vertical, just so make sure you adapt. How do you avoid short-termism? Uh, make sure you have a good business model that can last during and after. Right now, it's a test of resilience. So imagine you could hold off till June if that's going to be the timeline we need to hold off to. And some of your competitors are out of the window and you can survive till then. Imagine then the market opportunities for you after that. Try and look into D2C if this is the right business model for you if it makes that work. And if you're incumbent, how do you pivot to work into such business model itself? We mentioned some of the five industries that innovation is kind of spurring right now in Malaysia and some of the trends that we see picking up within Malaysia for 2022. So once you have the slides from us, uh, we built a couple of resources and good reading materials for you all around the world. Uh, the lead team spent a good time to build this toolbox of things you need from an early stage startup to a later stage startup to plan your entire journey itself along the recommended software and tools you could use to see you through this whole work from home policy. Uh, so if you want to get a copy of the slides, I'm going to pause it for a bit, go to this UR, URL or scan that QR code. Uh, we've got a little survey, of course we want to, and we want to basically send you the slides if you can do that, that'll be great. Um, and another thing I want to explain about is if you have a great idea and you're here thinking of some new ideas that we gave you some advice to, uh, join our digital accelerator. Closing date is actually tomorrow. There's still a lot of time for you to apply, but we're going to run a completely online digital accelerator where we've got over 100 people applied, we're going to put them all into a program, 
teach you the art of starting a startup, talk about the business model canvas and details of all these business models itself. And then the top few ideas, we're going to fund you, of course, exchange for a small little equity, uh, but that's something we can negotiate in terms of getting new ideas at this point of time out there itself. So we'll love to see how we can work with you. So I'm just going to leave it on this particular slide and I'm going to see if I could look at what Q&As are happening right now. So I think there's a lot going on in the chats. If there's something we can ask in the Q&A section, that'll be great. So in terms of getting a copy of the slides, yep, just go to that link. So I don't block that. Go to that link and you could get access to that slides. So we have a question here. How is the landscape now and for the coming year for newly budding tech startups when they are aiming startups and SMEs as customers? Currently talks has been SMEs are affected. Yeah, SMEs are definitely affected, but doesn't mean SMEs will stop doing every single thing. What they need is help. So if you have a solution that can help them survive in this point of time, then they're going to go to you. So one example is when we look at SMEs and F&B industry, uh, they had trouble trying to get that value chain or supply chain going. So if you have a solution that allows them to figure out where to get, like one restaurant we're speaking to or food delivery provider out there was saying she couldn't get access to fresh ingredients. So if someone could have a solution for her to get fresh ingredients, then she would gladly pay you because she's willing to buy those things and still continue her business as usual. So there's a couple of SMEs that have stopped dead in their tracks. That's going to be difficult. But there's some that are still running as usual, but they need access to more things to basically move on. And they're willing to still pay for such services, right? So it's not like every SME is dead in the water. In fact, what they want is help for them to get more sales. So if you can build a solution to give them access, give them distribution, give them uh, visibility, then there's always ways you could basically still get them as a revenue source. So in terms of the accelerator, we're doing every single thing. You can, you can be an SC and come in, you could be a game and come in, you could be a B2C or B2B, you could be enterprise and come in. One thing we haven't announced publicly is we actually have Accenture coming in to be one of the mentors in this particular accelerator program. So if you're doing a lot of B2B and enterprise, this is the program you want to join. You're going to get access to Accenture that mentors you. And maybe you want to see how you can provide solutions to some of the enterprise-based customers. So don't forget, there's a lot of enterprise customers in this country too, and I don't think so they're going to fall anytime soon. So they're going out and looking at this is the best time for them to buy over, acquire, or look at new service providers that could come in and help them scale it even better itself. So there's a lot of opportunity there to engage with those big boys. So if a startup is barely surviving after the MCO, is it the best time to raise money from investors? Well, as we always say, you know, the best time to raise is when you don't need money. When you need to raise because you need money, that's going to be a hard thing, but not an impossible thing. Some of the top startups out there we've seen raise money during such bad times. It just took them longer. Like Spotify, Spotify took one and a half years to raise that particular round, right? So you need to figure out where to find people who trust you with your particular service offering. Uh, I mean, the fact that, look, I'm just a small little investor out there spending our own money and we're willing to give out free random startups some particular funds. So there are always people like us that are out there that if you come to us with a good value proposition, we don't mind figuring out how to basically help you if it makes sense, right? So show us that you have something great and money usually comes to people who have great offerings. There are a lot of angel investors still out there these people are cash rich. They're looking for opportunities to come in and this is, this is your time to find them or just put that out there for them to find you. Every solution will be around going online, how to ensure to be outstanding in what is going to be in a crowded space. Well, I, I guess that's the same thing, right? If, if you're not online, you're offline and you have two shops next to each other, how do you make sure you're outstanding? It's about that three little things I talked about, making sure your product better than the other person. So look at what other people are doing and do it better, simple as that. What are people solving that it's uh, not addressed? So usually this is something quite interesting. You call this product market fit. People always solve what people want positively into an app. That means the typical features people want, you build out the same features your competitors have. Well, what people always forget is the competitors normally will miss out one or two things that become pain points for existing customers. 
that's the stuff you want to solve first, right? That's the difference between a good startup and a great startup. You're solving where the pain is and not just digitizing the pain online with that. So you want to make sure that you come in with a difference. And, and I've seen a lot of interesting startups come out very recently that suddenly overtook some of my investments like, like two years in and they came out of nowhere. So even though it was already a crowded space, we found that people with a compelling value proposition, compelling uh, messaging that goes out there, it's still the art of storytelling, can still, can still do better than existing people out there with runways and with funding. That, that's, that's something important we've seen time and time again. So Josephine has a question here. Good morning. Based on World Bank, the revised GDP growth forecast for Malaysia to yep, one point basis going down lower. We'd like to know with the reduce of the consumer spending, how can a new startup business overcome it? Yeah, I mean, there's reductions in certain things, but it's also not, right? I mean, that's why the government's having the stimulus plan and it's very public oriented because that's why they want to make sure that it doesn't happen. They want to make sure people don't stop spending, continue on and spend on your vital things, but other stuff. I mean, the problem arises if everyone now goes home and stops paying their Netflix bills and cancels Netflix subscription, then we know that's going to be a big issue itself, right? The fact that people are still having their Netflix and chilling at home and just Spotify streaming itself, people are still willing to spend on things they basically need. What they want and need is always different case to case. So you, as you build a particular application for someone, you need to understand your customer segment. Who are you addressing? Are you addressing the B40s, the M40s, or the T20s itself? If the T20s is not an issue. If it's the B40s, you'll notice that they are still going out buying food. They're still going out using Food Panda. They're still going out using Grab Food. So there's certain needs they basically need. Uh, so provide what they want. If you're giving them something they don't need, then obviously, no matter what, they have money or they don't have money, they're not going to give it to you itself. So you want them to figure out how to get that money to give it to you. How can startup build resilience mindset to, to thrive? Well, one is, you know, make sure that the people around you have all got the same resilience. You want to make sure you have, uh, I mean, that's what's great about having this kind of community is what Magic's doing, right? To be engaged in this kind of events, to, to chat among different peers that are all within that same mindset. You want to make sure that you, you are within such a circle of people to uh, like rub that off on you itself. It's not, it's not easy, but think about it that, you know, this is something you have to do. It's going to be stressful, but if you don't do it, then you're not going to see that light end of the tunnel and everything that you worked so hard for for the longest time is just gone. So you have to figure out how you have to make this work. And that means talk to people, communicate. Um, you know, we are always open. I think every Tuesday, even virtually, we still have our Tuesday sessions where you can just clock in office hours with us, tell us any issues you're having, and if we can help you solve it, point you to resources. We've always been that. I think Magic plays a great role in that too. You can always go to them and ask them questions on how you can move forward. And we're all here willing to help you guys with the situation. Okay. Okay, good to see that. We still have a lot of you guys online. Um, if there's any more questions, it's 12 o'clock, it's one hour. Um, we can still extend for another five, 10 minutes if you have questions. If not, this has been great. Uh, is that, are you still there? Okay, leave that mute. What do you think of export business? Uh, I think that's still something quite viable. Uh, just make sure that, you know, what you're exporting is, are you talking about very opportunistic stuff? Are you stuck with a whole crate of hand sanitizers out there you want to export? Uh, I'm not a big fan of it because uh, to me, yeah, it, it, it makes money. You buy something from China at this price, mark it up and send it off somewhere else. Um, it's, it's an okay business. It's something that you would make money. Whether what you want to think about is, is this a viable business to scale and what does that mean? Export to what degree itself? Uh, a lot of paperwork business that is, but a lot of regulations in that particular business. So if you have those things in order and you're try, not trying to export certain things that is difficult to do based on regulations, then by all means, go ahead. 
for businesses that is B2B, most likely after MCO, there will be cost cutting exercise across our business. Do we still need to think of a way to business or business model? Uh, well, depending on who you're serving from a B2B perspective, right? Is it enterprise B2B? Is it SME B2B? Uh, depends. Uh, some of them, if they can afford it, sure. But you always want to think about tiered pricing, right? Find ways that you can help the customers still buy, uh, make it more affordable. If they buy more, you give them better deals. Uh, you can always have some pullback that, you know, if you cut price, then, you know, how are you different in terms of the, the other value propositions you give them, in terms of your service level offerings you give them, where can certain things be traded off when you want to basically offer them services. So think about how you have trade-offs when you want to negotiate different pricings with them. Don't give them everything for less than price. You got to you know, change that up too. Without the accelerator, can we still approach lead to bounce ideas, conduct discussions? Yeah, of course. So we're all here. Everyone at lead is still working every single day. Office hours are there. Uh, so even the accelerator, the rooms are open every single day for you to come in at a certain time to just ask us questions and just bounce ideas itself or have a virtual coffee session with us. We're definitely there. Oh, hey, Sam. For those with current funding needs, how can startup founders ensure to maintain their pre-COVID deemed valuations and low boarding. <laughs> well, well, you know, desperate times, desperate measures itself. So that's why we keep saying, you know, if you're trying to raise money, always raise it when you don't need it. If you're raising it now, it's why we're getting a lot of people come to us and, and say they need 1 million. And, and it's very obvious when you, when you give certain numbers for a certain runway, we know that this is OPEX. So that's the scary part. If you want to raise properly, make sure that you're using it for the right reasons. If you're showing, no matter what your valuation is, if you're showing you need money to burn, to survive, it's very OPEX oriented, that's a red flag. That means without the money, you're going to die. It only can have a short runway, you're going to die. And that will just you know, spook any investor. They wouldn't even want to talk about valuation. They wouldn't want to lowball you because they know that you know, even if I lowball you and get a great equity stake, but in 12 months, if you don't continue running and you don't continue sales, then that 12, 20% more that I take, it's just going to be worth zero, right? So it's not so much about lowballing, it's about showing that you have some great offerings and you can negotiate. I mean, we just did an investment now in a Hong Kong-based company for, for something that we usually don't invest. It's a bigger amount than we usually invest. For a ridiculous percentage, it's less than 1% itself. But we still did the deal. We didn't lowball them because we saw the offering was great. The founders were great. They were onto something really big and we wanted to be part of it. And we, we invested more than we usually did and took less than we usually do. Uh, so I think always have options. So make sure you don't just rely on one investor. Make sure you go as many as possible out there. Uh, we will love to see how Cradle kicks back in with their new grants that supposedly supposed to be in April. I think that's delayed, of course, with the current situation. But that's something you want to think about how to leverage, right? The, the grants out there, uh, Cradle should have a couple of grants coming out and it's going to be quite big ones. But again, most of these grants now will be not about just throwing government money at you, but making sure how they help you if you have something great. So you want to make sure you get to that halfway point, build that prototype, build that MVP, get a couple of customers in. Then when you go to these grants, your value is always better than the guy who comes just with a PowerPoint presentation saying, I'm entitled to this grant and, and I want it, right? So don't just expect you need money to build something. You are the resource, right? The whole idea of building a team is you've got the developer, the designer, the, the, the entrepreneur, which is the CEO. At this point of time, if you can build as much as possible with less resources in terms of dollars and cents, that becomes a very compelling argument when you go to an investor and show them what you've done with nothing. So then we will just imagine if you had more, if I gave you more, imagine what you could do with that money. So that, that's the way you want to communicate with investors. Show them how you're doing with less and then we know you can do more with, of course, the more we give you. Uh, what is your advice for SEs who does not have a digital strategy, does not leverage on technology? Will it be too late to start one now? It's not too late. I mean, everyone's seen that funny joke going about, right? Like what was the cause of your digital transformation? Was it your CEO, CTO, or COVID-19? I think this is something that just pushed everyone to think of a digital adoption. What you need to figure out now is how do you build a digital strategy, maybe on a, on a short-term basis to jump on an existing platform to help you, and then slowly figure out how would you build one in-house if you need to itself. Uh, so that's something, you know, if you need to, uh, ping us directly and we can see how we can help you on that. Because we work with a lot of local SEs. We invested in a few SEs and we're helping them a lot on their digital strategies on being a very tech-oriented social enterprise, leveraging on that. 
an idea to scale because that's what scale is right if i give you ten dollars how do you achieve more than what ten dollars could basically do and, and tech allows you to basically do that rather than just spend ten dollars to grow and buy users i want ten dollars to give me a hundred users itself so you need to think about how you leverage tech for stuff like that okay it's 1207 that's 50 people i lost two guys so very good uh great great attendance great great people great questions Thank you so much for being with us for this particular session with magic in terms of this webinar series there's going to be a lot more i think they're doing one every week so that's amazing so make sure you tune into all the amazing speakers that's going to be around for the next few weeks itself and again if you're interested in joining the accelerator the url let me just plug myself here itself it's here it's here it's here go to that url and basically sign up you don't even need an idea to sign up the idea is we want to walk you through the process of starting a startup, right? So we'll give you, I mean, you have the talk today and give you ideas. I want to show you the way you could start your own startup. And it's up to you whether at the end you want to pitch the idea or not. But we want to see how we can help as many people just know the steps in launching something effectively online itself. So that's me, Bikish from Lead Ventures. Thanks to my team who's on board. Max and Kavita for helping with the questions and handling the chats just now. Thanks to Magic and everyone here itself for joining us today. Go grab some lunch and I'll see you soon. Take care.